So hi everyone, uh, welcome. It's a couple of minutes after the hour. I'm going to get started introducing the series and then uh, hand it off to the person who actually has been doing much of the work organizing this series, Frank Fogarty. Um, I'm Dan Barton. I, uh, I have the uh, honor of being the Wildlife Department Chair. And uh, on behalf of the entire department, we'd like to welcome you to the first Next Generation Wildlife Eco Series of Spring 2021. This is the first of four. There may be a late minute edition, at least four planned um, seminars in this series for spring 2021. Um, so please keep in touch with us if you're interested in attending more of them. Uh, the Next Generation Wildlife Eco Series highlights the achievements and amplifies the voices of early career wildlife biologists. The next generation of wildlife biologists and scientists is more diverse than the community of natural resource scientists currently extant as a whole. And we recognize that systemic racism continues to impose barriers for black indigenous people of color seeking careers in natural resources. The speaker series tries to highlight will, and will not only highlight uh, and spotlight the professional achievements of Black, Indigenous, people of color, scientists who are role models for this next generation, but it also serves as a forum to discuss how our field can move forward to reduce barriers and become a more inclusive community. The Wildlife Department is uh, committed to attempting to challenge the status quo in the discipline and to uh, help propel forward a more diverse next generation of wildlife biologists. Uh, so with that, I turn it over to uh, Dr. Frank Fogarty, who will introduce today's speaker. Thanks, Dan. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Juita Martinez. Uh, Juita is a PhD candidate at the University of Louisiana Lafayette, and her current research focuses on the breeding ecology and demography of brown pelicans in coastal Louisiana. Juita also graduated from HSU uh, in 2016 with a, a bachelor's in, in zoology and a minor in wildlife. And she was also a co-organizer of Black Birders Week, uh, if you're not familiar with that, it was a, a social media event that aimed to shed light on the difficulties of being a Black birder and the challenges of simply being outside. Juita also serves on various diversity, equity, and inclusion projects, advocating for the BIPOC community through both consultations and mentoring the next generation of scientists. So with that, I'll turn things over to Juita. Cool. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Let me share my screen. Let's hope this works. <laughs> <laughs> Again, sorry if I'm looking around. I'm going to try to um, try to do this. Okay, cool. Hi, everyone. Welcome to my talk again. Um, I'll be talking about the different factors that we found to have influenced the breeding success of brown pelicans here in coastal Louisiana. Next slide, please. Before I get started with my talk, I would like to acknowledge that I am currently living and working on the land that belongs to Chichimacha tribe here. They have been stewards of this land long before it was stolen from them and they continue to be those stewards today. Next slide, please. So this is the one and only photo that I have to prove that at one time I was a student at HSU and I was just like you all sitting um, here today if you're students. Next slide, please. So um, this is actually a photos from my time in, at my NSF REU at the College of Charleston. As you can tell, we all have to start somewhere. And how you know that I didn't know what I was doing is because I was wearing a white t-shirt in this environment, this very muddy environment. Um, can you click, right? Look at my face. My face is telling you that I really didn't know what I was doing. Um, but here I am today. I have learned, I have grown, um, and I will talk about my research a little bit after this. Um, can you click? So before moving to Louisiana, all I really knew about it was Mardi Gras and Swampland. Can you click? But little did I know, Louisiana is home to some of the most incredible wildlife species that I have ever gotten to work with and or seen. Um, next slide, please. So this is a photo of one of the towns that I work out of and it's called Grand Isle, Louisiana. Houses are built on the stilt because flooding is such a big issue here. And I will talk a little bit about why that is. And this just surprised me when I moved here. I've never seen houses like this before. And it's genius. Your house doesn't flood when it's on stilts like this. Um, next slide, please. 
So Louisiana is home to a bunch of resource rich habitat, which makes it perfect for a bunch of birds to utilize this space as their homes and place to raise their young. Um, when I go out into the field, I always see shrimp boats. There's a ton of oil rigs around. And yeah, it's just one of those busy, busy places. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, we might have to click twice. There's two bird photos. Um, can you like, <laughs> sorry, yeah, can you go to the next slide? Okay, cool, awesome. Um, Sorry, I'm gonna skip like some of the slides that are not as important just because I don't wanna keep you all here forever. Um, so the thing about brown pelicans here is that in the 1940s, DDT was very widespreadly used and this resulted in eggshell thinning. Can you go to the next slide? So we all know about biomagnification and we mostly associate DDT with the bald eagle decline, but the same thing actually happened to brown pelicans here in Louisiana. And because they're top predators, they got really affected by it. Oh, that was good. No, that was perfect timing. <laughs> um, so by in 1919, there was an estimated 50,000 brown pelicans utilizing the Louisiana coastline. And by 1938, there was only about 5,000. And by 1961, when surveyors went out, they actually didn't see any breeding pairs at all. And by 1963, they were completely gone. There were no brown pelicans on the Louisiana coastline. And if you didn't know this, brown pelican is actually our state bird. So the state bird not being in the state is not a good sign at all. Um, next slide, please. And by 1970s, they were enlisted as endangered on, by the Endangered Species Act. Next slide, please. So not to make it all doom and gloom, a bunch of people came together. Um, the, wild, the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries and the Florida Fish Commission both worked together with the public and a bunch of volunteers to actually restore the brown pelican population here in Louisiana. And they did this by something called translocation. And what translocation means is we're gonna take brown pelicans from a relatively stable um, site and move it to a site where either the numbers are low or they no longer exist there, but they once did. And this program started in 1968 and an average of about 110 pelicans were moved from Florida to Louisiana um, for about 16 years and it worked. They didn't know that it would work, but it did. And this is the reason why we have pelicans here today. Next slide, please. So just a little bit of background. Um, a significant portion of the United States seabird population utilizes the Louisiana coastline in order to complete their reproductive cycles. Unfortunately, due to anthropogenic and environmental factors, we're losing our coastline at a very, very fast rate. And to combat these losses, there have been huge restoration projects put into place since the 1990s. Next slide, please. So this is a photo just to show you all the predicted land loss over the next 50 years. Okay, can you click again? Cool. These are all of the ongoing restoration projects, which I will show you a little bit of how um, the restoration happens here in coastal Louisiana, spe specifically on barrier islands. <laughs> cool. And it looks like this, but I'll go into more detail in a couple of minutes. Awesome. So this is a graph by Selman et al. 2016. The arrow is actually pointing at the peak number of nests that we saw. And that was actually pre-Hurricane Katrina in 2005 at a little over 17K nests. We actually have not seen these numbers again since, and the population is in flux. There have been some um, disasters such as hurricanes, but also human-made disasters such as oil spills that have occurred since 2005, which have not allowed the population to reach back into those numbers. Um, can you click, please? Cool. Okay, so some reasons of why we have coastal land loss here in Louisiana. Um, 
some anthropogenic causes is actually due to the Mississippi River being levied and dammed. Um, this doesn't allow for the natural water flow to occur and deposit sediment throughout the coastline. Instead, we now have something called a bird's foot delta, which is where a majority of the sediment is deposited. Can you click? We also have things such as invasive species. You're looking at a nutria here. Um, they eat the vegetation. They eat um, beach nesting bird eggs. Um, they're pretty bad. And um, there is a bounty on them actually, which doesn't help that much. Can you click again? Cool. So some environmental causes um, that are leading towards coastal land loss is Louisiana is literally sinking, which is basically what subsidence means. And just to give everyone an example, um, the walls in my house don't make a 90 degree angle. And <laughs> because certain parts of the house is sinking faster than others. Can you click? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to be fancy. Um, so sea level rise and tropical storms also de uh, degrade the land by causing rapid erosion and massive land movements. Cool. Okay. Awesome. So some objectives to my dissertation research, and this is all preliminary analysis. Um, I'm in that part of my phase where I have the next two years to really dive deep into all of my data. We are just looking at what are the differences in brown pelican nest success? And this is a uh, binary, they either, that they either had a successful nest or they had a failed nest across the different islands. And some islands have been restored and some islands have not been restored. We, would all, we were also looking at, are there differences in the success or failure depending on what substrate the nest was placed on? And what are the probabilities that brown pelicans are using restored islands more than unrestored islands because billions of dollars are getting put into the restoration process? Okay, click. Cool, so just a little bit about my study site. Um, everything in the triangle means that that island has been restored. And basically restoration just means it has had some human help to help maintain the island. And the two squares are actually unrestored islands, but there are brown pelicans that utilize that space to nest. So this is a diagram showing the land loss that has happened in Louisiana between 1932 and 2016. As you can see, all of that land that's becoming blue or is becoming blue is becoming the water basically. Um, and there is a date at the upper right corner I don't know if you can start, can you all see that? Okay, great. Yes, <laughs> thank you, Frank. Um, and we have lost the amount of land equivalent to that of the size of Delaware. Can you click? So this diagram is showing you the amount of land that we are predicted to lose in the next 50 years. And those black arrows are actually my five study sites. So as you can see, if nothing is done um, in coastal Louisiana in the next 50 or so years, my entire study site will be lost as well. Um, can you click? Cool, so it's not all doom and gloom. We have restoration as I talked about, billions of dollars have been spent and um, about 60 miles of barrier islands have been restored so far. And that is highlighted in the red. Can you click again? Cool, so just to show everybody really quickly how restoration works, basically you have these massive pipes that span miles. These um, restoration projects takes months to complete, if not years. Um, can you click? And what happens is they're gonna dredge, which means they're basically pumping sediment from an area that has a lot of sediment to an area that doesn't have a lot of sediment, which is the barrier islands, for example. And can you click again? Sorry. <laughs> and just to show everybody what this looks like. So on the left-hand side, this was prior to 2019. I worked on this island for two years. And when I say work, I really mean swim um, to get to all of my different cameras and all my equipment out there versus this past year, 2020, I got to walk on this island. It looks way nicer. This is way more stable. There's way more space for all different kinds of birds to nest on. Um, 
And yeah, so they're gonna replant this actually. As the years go by, they'll keep planting shrubs basically for the pelicans. Can you click? Cool. Okay, one of the methods that I use to monitor these brown pelicans is camera traps, as I had mentioned earlier. Um, and we have our camera traps out there from February through July. I have two full years of data. And because of COVID last year, I have this three month gap that is missing <laughs> in my data because we weren't allowed to go out there. And um, this gives you a really clear look of what I get to see um, of the brown pelican chicks. Can you click? Um, we get to see things such as behavioral, and this is just a, the parents defending a nest, and even what happens during a hurricane. And basically we found out that these pelicans just float, floated out basically. Okay, cool. So this is just a closer up look. In case you couldn't see, I wasn't sure how well this would show up, um, but we can see that there are about two chicks per nest. Can you click again? And this is an example of feeding behavior. Um, it's something I'm interested in looking at is how often these pelicans are being fed throughout the breeding season. Cool. Okay. Awesome. So our covariates for our model is next, nest success or fail across five different islands. And then we're looking at these three different habit or nest substrates which is live woody, dead woody, or if they're nesting on the ground. And just to keep in mind, when they're nesting on the ground, they are way more vulnerable to flooding events. Cool. Okay. Awesome. Something else that I'm looking at is historical data. So I have data from the 1990s all the way through 2017. And this is what it looks like when um, there are airplanes sent to monitor these pelicans. It basically gives us as close as we can get to a census of these barrier islands. And it's someone's job to individually count all of these nests, and then I get those numbers. <laughs> so thankfully, I don't have to count all these nests. And what I've done is I've gone into Google Earth Pro. Now I'm using QGIS, but this is just uh, like a month ago, this was the new um, occurrence that I'm going to switch over to QGIS. And what I'm measuring is how far are these islands from the mainland and how large are these islands? Because both of those um, have been shown to influence whether or not a pelican will use an island to nest on. Can you click? So some results are that we have found that brown pelicans have a higher probability of successfully raising at least one chick um, if they are on a restored island compared to an unrestored island, which is good. This means restored islands, although they're not being restored necessarily to help brown pelicans, they are helping the population out. Um, and fledging basically just means they have left the nest. They're old enough to thermoregulate. They're old enough to go and hang out outside of the nest while their parents go and fish and forage. Cool, can you click to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so another thing we wanted to do was to see what was the probability of at least one chick making it across all five islands. Um, and this is all preliminary, but we found that Raccoon and Queen Bess um, had a higher probability of nest success um, compared to Brandy and four, this only encompassed 2018 and 2019. And just in Brandy's defense, the island, um, Brandy constantly was flooding in 2019. And that's why we think we see this really low success rate. Although it is a restored island, it hasn't been restored in about a decade. Can we? Cool, awesome. And our last thing that we looked at, um, does the distance from the island to the mainland have any effect? And what we found was brown pelican like colony size increase the further they are, they are from the mainland. And this is what we expected to see because the closer these nesting islands are to the mainland, the more likely you can have predators swim over, whether that be raccoons, Coyotes do end up on some barrier islands and even gators. <laughs> um, we also saw a higher number 
um, on restored islands compared to unrestored islands. So there were more brown pelicans, which makes more sense, which makes sense because these islands tend to be larger and more stable to actually uh, be able to support these brown pelicans. Next slide, please. Cool. So preliminary analysis indicate that flooding of ground nesting pelicans are our main source of uh, mortality when I thought it was definitely going to be predation from the nutria. That was where I was going. Um, and nests that did fail usually failed before the eggs even hatched. I did not see any evidence of predation. There was this one where a nutria appeared and then the nutria disappeared, but that was about it. And in general, we saw that restored islands were great for brown pelicans, which is an awesome, awesome thing to find out. Um, next slide, please. Cool, so some future research that I'm hoping to accomplish is to incorporate island elevation and the provisioning rates, like I mentioned earlier. So how often are these pelicans being fed? I also wanna look at daily survival rates. Um, not sure if this is possible, but I'm talking to some collaborators such as Frank <laughs> and we'll figure this out. I also have about 4 million images that I need to go through, which is not possible to do during the span of a PhD project. So I'm going to figure out a method to subset these images. Um, can we click to the next slide? So just to give you all a little more of an idea of things that I'm planning on using in my dissertation, we're putting GPS tags on adult brown pelicans, five per island, so 25 total. Um, that little square with the yellow, that's showing you the GPS tag, and that's my collaborator, Brock Geary. How do you weigh an adult brown pelican? Totally easy. Um, you have a permit to catch them, and then you put them in a tent bag with a luggage scale. <laughs> um, so we get to follow their movement throughout the breeding season. Can you click to the next slide? So this is just preliminary data. Um, each, um, each colored line is one brown pelican throughout the breeding season. What we can see for the most part is they don't overlap. So a pelican from one island doesn't overlap with a pelican from a different island for the most part. And that top um, photo is just showing you all the different restoration sites. Um, next slide, please. Something else I'm looking at is ban reciting. So with the coast changing so frequently, ban reciting is a very non-invasive, inexpensive way to see whether or not brown pelicans are moving from one island to another. They're banded for the most part on islands that they were born on. So what happens when these islands that they were born on disappear? We don't really know. Um, they either move to a nearby island or it's um, guessed that they are actually leaving the Louisiana population as a whole and either going to Texas or Alabama or Florida. Um, and this just gives us a little bit of a way, a way to estimate if we see a brown pelican on island A, but it was banded on island B, we know that it's moved. And this is just to show everybody what these bands look like. It's literally looking for a needle in a haystack. I know it seems easy because these photos show it really well, but I promise when you have 10,000 brown pelicans around, it's really hard to spot them. You can click it again for another photo. I happen to get lucky with this one. My camera caught a pelican with a band on it. And my camera trap also happened to catch a pelican with a band on it. This doesn't happen often, I promise. <laughs> Next slide, please. Cool, so I don't know if I have time for all this, but I have a few slides of when things went terribly wrong in the field because they are inevitably gonna go wrong. Um, my camera traps have very little like leeway for where, where they can move. And when a 16 pound adult brown pelican decides to perch on my camera trap, which is that photo on the left-hand side, um, unfortunately I get 10,000 photos of vegetation. Or when our boat dies in the Gulf of Mexico and someone has to come give us a tow. Uh, we also, at one point, we have to kayak to one of our islands because the ground is not walkable. It's very like 
silty and you'll sink basically down to your hips. Um, and we didn't realize how far we left our boat. <laughs> um, can you click to the next? Okay, this is Frank's like, or Dan's favorite <laughs> um, photo, I feel like. One of those is a video. I think the one on your left, if you wanna play that video of how I had to free this camera to switch out the battery and the memory card, which is what I do every two weeks. And it's currently being held by a strip of t-shirt because those actually tighten as it's exposed to salt water. Innovative, right? Um, this doesn't happen regularly, but when it does, it takes me a lot longer to like switch out my equipment. <laughs> Next slide, please. Oh, cool. Something else I didn't know about in Louisiana are, is something called fire ants. I don't believe we had them in California. <laughs> if we did, I never ran into them. Um, but they are called fire ants because when they bite you, it feels like you're on fire and it's not fun. Um, you can play the clip. Hey, you see the bag. Camera traps have been hijacked by these ants. Oh no, it's on <laughs> me. There's one on me. <laughs> Things like that happen a lot. <laughs> I usually just don't show them. Yeah, so something else that's really great about field work in Louisiana is being swarmed. And when I say swarm, I mean eyeballs, ears, nose, mouth. These mosquitoes are everywhere. Um, this is just to show you <laughs> what it looks like out there. Delena happened to come out with me and she was like, why'd you invite me? And I was like, sorry. <laughs> um, next slide, please. Um, something else that happens here that I never experienced on the West Coast was how fast the weather changes. One second it'll be sunny, the next it'll be downpour, and I, I, you can't even see the boat launch. Um, <laughs> and can you play the video of the boat? So it was clear, it was a nice day. We were heading out to our island, and this was the first time back in the field since 2020. And all of a sudden, this dense fog just surrounds us. Hopefully you can tell by that, but there's supposed to be an island in front of us and we can't see the island. Um, so things like that happen out of nowhere. <laughs> um, sometimes lightning happens out of nowhere too. This is the most exciting thing. Okay, I just went into the field this weekend and this is what I saw last year. So February 28th, 2020. Can you play the video, please? This is a normal island. There's pelicans everywhere. There's nests everywhere. The eggs are actually about to hatch around this time. That's what we expect to see. Can you go to the next slide and play that video? This is what I actually saw last weekend. Nothing. Dead silence. Not a single bird nesting not a bird, not a nest, just nothing. This is not normal at all. Um, and it's a little concerning, but we might have some explanations. Can you click on the next slide? So this is what my backyard looked like for about nine days. Can you play the video on the left? Um, there was just ice everywhere. We had a really hard freeze for about nine days here in the South which is not normal. If we usually have a freeze, it's usually in December or January. And this is before the pelicans migrate back up and come back from wherever they decided to winter, whether that was Texas or um, Central or South America. And they feed on something called Gulf Menhaden. We found that Gulf Menhaden actually make up 99% of their diet, which is cool to know. Unfortunately, when it freezes, Gulf Menhaden go offshore and into deeper water. These pelicans can only dive so deep and they, like I showed earlier with that graph of their movements, they don't really go that far offshore and they really can't go off that far because they have to make it back and feed their babies. Um, so now that their food resource has dispersed, we don't know what's gonna happen next. Are they gonna come back and nest? Are they not? Um, can you go to the next slide? And this is a potential issue because we're expecting the eggs for the most part to start hatching around this time. It takes seven to 10 days for them just to build their massive nest. And then another 29 to 35 for those eggs to incubate and then hatch. Um, 
if this happens too late in the season, we start to see other issues. Can you go to the next slide? So let's say they started on Monday. We would expect the eggs to hatch around mid-April. And as you can tell by this graph, we have really, really high temperatures coming up. And these pelicans are born featherless. Their eyes are closed. Um, if for some reason their parents are spooked, they can easily overheat um, in the heat. Another thing is we are also expecting a very active hurricane season. Um, so yeah, that's their other issue. If they take too long and they have downy feathers, just as you can see in this photo, we expect them to not be able to make it through these really, really strong tropical storms and hurricanes, which are set to start on June 1st. And they're definitely not going to be old enough with it, with these downy feathers if they hatch too late in the season. Cool. Next slide, I think. Cool. Okay. So thank you so much for hanging in there with me. That was a little rough start that we had. I just wanted to give the biggest shout out to all of my undergrads that make this project possible. All my undergrads have the little asterisks. As you can see, there's a lot of them. And um, thank you to everyone else who helped out with this project as well as funding. And with that, I will take any questions. I did kind of skim. I'm sorry, I didn't go like as deep as I wanted to with every slide. <laughs> Uh, I had a question. Yeah. And and thank you, by the way. Um, I had to do with that map you showed of the movement patterns with all the lines, and you said that they don't really overlap too much. I was just wondering why that why that is. Are the individuals all choosing different like flight patterns or something like that? Yeah. So it's probably a combination of uh, niche partitioning, like if they all like hunted near the same area, they would deplete their fish resources pretty quickly, but it's also, um, they're central place foragers, meaning they go out and fish and then they come back to the central place and that central place is where their nest is at. Um, and they can't go too far because their partners are going to get hungry and the chicks are going to get hungry. So they need to be close enough catch the fish, bring it back, switch out with their partner so their partner can go fish, bring it back. And so it's a combination of those two things. I had a question about the restoration. You said, I think on Brandy Island, it hadn't been um, restored in quite a time. How long does the restoration of that island last before it needs to be restored again? So usually in general, the goal is a decade. When they restore these islands, they really, really hope that these islands can last at least a decade, if not more. But since we're seeing so many storms um, and so many hurricanes hit, that's gonna cost the island some years for sure. Yes, Dan. Um, I saw uh, there was a question a ways back that was just in the chat from Ken uh, who asked, uh, it was kind of a context question. What was the cause of the pre-DDT decline? It was DDT, like that's when, like around the 40s, like early 40s is when DDT was starting to be used. Um, there was also some really strong storms that happened around that same time. So they're thinking it was a mix of those two things. And then, and then I had one too, the, the event you described is like super interesting, right? With this hard freeze. I mean, my dad lives in Houston, so I heard all about it. It was wild, right? And um, the, is there any evidence uh, in the Gulf, you know, maybe not just with pelicans in general, or maybe with pelicans of like a seabird rack or some kind of mass die-off event that was associated with that? Or is it just seem like shifting distributions at the moment? Or maybe, maybe you can't tell. Yeah, so I actually got a DM from an LDWF um, scientist, and she said there was a huge die-off in Terrebonne Bay, which is in the area that I work on, but they can't tell if it was because of a ship or if it was because of the freeze. But just to give everyone an example, um, that video that was taken that I showed you all from last year, that is Louisiana's largest brown pelican nesting colony. It's about 10,000 pairs are estimated to utilize that island. And I saw 30 adult brown pelicans. 
And then my other, just following up on that, is there any precedent? Because, you know, there's there's been big winter storms in, in like Houston, at least in the Gulf in the past. Like there was one in 2010, maybe, where there was a freeze. And, and then there was one back in the 19-somethings, the um, at least one. Uh, you know, does, does that happen? Does the same kind of pattern occur in, in those years, too, where the birds just don't nest? So that salmon at all paper from 2016, it hasn't happened since they were translocated. I mean, there was like obviously a very slow growth in the beginning when they first were getting translocated um, into coastal Louisiana. The only thing I can't figure out is that there's missing data for 1991. And I've been trying to look into that. Um, that's the only other year that there isn't any data for brown pelicans. Other than that, they've been, they've nested every single year. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? I have a question. Yes. Um, I'm not too familiar with like catching animals yet, but I was wondering um, how do you go about catching the pelicans to ban them? Okay. Chicks are so easy because we get them before they can fly. So they're just really soft, floofy things. You just scoop them up. Um, the adults, on the other hand, uh, <laughs> we, okay, we need a permit. Don't go doing this. Um, I know no one here will, but I feel like I have to say that. Uh, we run really, really fast. And usually we hope that they get a little startled and either they panic and just freeze or that they'll run into vegetation. But that's basically how we do it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I was trying to relate this with other studies somewhere else. And to be precise, back home, uh, I'm from Kenya, uh, oh. and I've done a lot of uh, research on waterfowl. So I was wondering, uh, in a situation whereby, because from your descriptions, it looks like uh, the Luciana doesn't have forest. So I was wondering if there was forest, natural forest. Would the pelican prefer natural forest to the restored wetland? Because they look like they breed on... Uh, uh, on the ground, right? Yeah, so... Yeah, because back home, uh, yeah, back home, we have two species of pelicans. We have the greater white pelican and lesser uh, pelicans. But uh, from my experience working with pelicans as well, is that I've never seen any pelican nesting on the ground. So I was wondering if there is that option of pelicans in where you're working, would they, do you think they will go for forest or they will still nest on the ground? I feel like they would not, only because there's so many other birds that nest here. So if, for example, the egrets, the spoonbills, they take up like all of the swampland forests. Um, also, they utilize the barrier islands and the barrier islands aren't high enough to support any plants. And when they are high enough to support plants or trees, I should say, um, they, we actually see raccoons, coyotes, gators, and nutria because these mammals and the gators um, need that shelter. So we, we don't see them on any barrier islands that have trees on them, but they, they're shrubs in the form of black mangrove. But I know what you're talking about with the pelicans <laughs> in Africa, they do use trees, it's super cool. <laughs> Yes. Um, I was interested to know, and maybe you haven't had an opportunity, especially now with COVID, but um, have you had an opportunity to do any outreach or when you're doing research, do people ask you, hey, what are you doing? And just to get a sense of, you know, are people really proud of their state bird and excited about your research or, or what, what are people in Louisiana feeling about pelicans? Yeah, I think um, pelicans here give people a sense of hope and resiliency because they made a comeback and they've like lived through all of the devastating events, including losing their islands. Like they've lost a handful of islands since 2010 alone that they used to breed on, but they're still here. Um, I have gotten so many messages of people wanting to come out and volunteer um, since they found out about my work, whether that's like via Ologies or Black Birders Week, which is great and awesome. I love the extra help. Unfortunately, COVID makes it really hard 
to allow volunteers to come out. We have a very strict like COVID testing protocol and testing is actually harder <laughs> to get here than I would expect. Cool, thanks. Cool. Any other questions? Um, yeah, I just had a question about the restoration. Uh, I was wondering how that is done because it seems like um, brown pelicans are often occupying islands that have been restored. And is it something where they try to get it done before they may come back for the nesting season? Or is it one that they like just know based off historical data that if they did restore it, brown pelicans would come back? Yeah, so Queen Bess, it was done during the fall. So August, which is when most of the brown pelicans leave, is when they started, and they ended right around mid-February. Um, but something like Raccoon Island, which is the biggest, it holds the most pelican nesting grounds, or nests, sorry, and they were working on it while the pelicans were nesting, and they were just staying out of the pelicans' way. So both occur. That island was just, Raccoon Island is just so much bigger, it would be impossible almost to restore that island within a matter of a few months. Gotcha, thanks. Yes. I got one more quick one, more of a seabird ecology question. Well, really nesting success question, right? So you showed that neat difference between restored and unrestored islands. And I have to admit my dog was being annoying and I kind of maybe like lost focus for a second there. And, um, what do you think causes that? Is that because the, maybe the restored islands have fewer nest predators? You may have said this and I missed it, but um, I'm sort of curious about what that potential explanation for that is. Yeah, no problem. So restored islands have a few different things to them. One, when we put all that sediment, and when I say we, I'm not actually doing the res restoration, but they, they elevate the island to where it's high enough that it should withstand everyday wave actions and quite a few storms but it's not high enough where it would support trees because of the predators. Um, also, usually there is either breakwaters, so there's rows of really big boulders which help to mitigate wave action, storm surges, et cetera, or they have a rock barrier around the entire island which keeps that sediment in place. Um, and the other thing that they do during restoration is they usually will go back and plant the native plants that are found there for about three years and that further helps to stabilize the sediment versus unrestored islands which actually one of my islands right now is basically a mud flat um, and it's unrestored and just all of those storms that we saw last year and everyday wave erosion has basically made this island unnestable. Yes. Um, back to the restoration. So I know you, I thought you mentioned that, so they are restoring the islands, not necessarily for pelicans. It just so happens that it helps out the pelican population. Is there, um, what aspect, like why are they re restoring the islands and where's the funding coming from? And what's the public's like general opinion of using possible tax dollars for this restoration projects? So it's actually all BP money from the Deepwater Horizon spill in 2010, and that's meant to run out in 2032. So that's where all the restoration money is coming from, so no tax dollars. Um, and sorry, what was your first question? I like blinked. <laughs> what, were the, what is the main reason for restoring the islands? Yeah, so actually the main reason is to protect the coastline and human lives and human infrastructure. So when you have these barrier islands, when we have a storm, the barrier islands are the first line of defense. So these storms will hit the barrier islands and then dissipate a little bit depending on how strong the storms are. And this means the marshes, um, all of the levees, all the houses that are on the coast have less hitting them because of these barrier islands. I have a question, Jurita. Yeah. Do you know how much, have you all figured out how much site fidelity the adults have to these colonies? Are they really coming back to the same island every year as long as it doesn't turn into a mud flat? Or are they being opportunistic about choosing different sites? Yeah, so Dr. Scott Walters, who was the grad student right before me who worked on pelicans, he found that they have really high 
Ness site fidelity. The only thing that he couldn't completely figure out is what happens when they lose their natal sites. Um, he, he did suspect that they actually leave the Louisiana population as a whole, which is bad news for us because like I said, one of my islands is turning into a mud flat and there was about 500 pelicans nesting there in 2018. one more. Are there any um, examples of that, that you've gotten familiar with of um, seabird fisheries conflicts uh, with, with brown pelicans along the Louisiana coast? You know, it's a big topic here historically in California. Currently, there are, there are still some issues, but, but how about uh, in that region there? So because the brown pelicans mostly eat Gulf menhaden, the menhaden industry is actually very well regulated. Um, so there's not, there's usually enough for the humans and enough for the brown pelicans. And there's not like bycatch issues so much with brown pelicans there? No, I haven't heard of any bycatch issues. I actually asked the person who DM'd me from LDWF about it and she said there wasn't either. <laughs> That's a great question. I'm glad I asked her. <laughs> yes. Uh, what is LWD? Or oh, what is that? It's Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. If anyone thinks of any questions, feel free to email me. You can DM me on Twitter. <laughs> Juita, I just want to say thank you on behalf of all of us. Um, and uh, I, it, it's, it's great to see you giving a talk. I remember when you were in Wildlife 311 and you didn't talk as much. And it's awesome to see you. I didn't talk at all. Did I talk at all? I don't you were, you were pretty that. quiet. Yeah, it was really quiet. Yeah. But no, I mean, it's just awesome to see you um, uh, uh, presenting all this awesome work you're doing. So, so thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Cool. Thanks for having me. Sorry again for the technical difficulty. <laughs> we made it work. It was great. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for coming. Thank you. Thanks, Rita. Thank you. Hey, Julita, do you have like 30 seconds for a, a technical question about trail camera use in yes. Super <laughs> Yes, <laughs> if anybody else is about this, feel free to listen in, I guess. Um, okay, so I'm, you know, I'm doing the same thing a little bit, right? With um, on Sand Island in Arcata Bay and maybe on Teal Island. We're trying to see if we can get permission to do that right now. Um, but I did it last year on Sand Island and, and you showed a picture. So I know you've thought about this, like you're using like T-posts with the camera mounted on it or some kind of post, right? So I, I, you know, last year I used wooden stakes and rebar and like, wasn't a good idea because the cormorants pulled some of them out. I think I sent you a picture and like put them in their nests, which is just, then the cameras don't work at all. They get a picture of like a cormorant, but until it gets totally covered in poop and it doesn't work at all. So, um, you know, so I'm gonna use T-Post this year. I just was being cheap last year, I guess. Uh, but I still got good data. But the problem is that, you know, once you mount them up a little higher, um, one, they can maybe be a collision risk for cormorants just because cormorants are so awkward in the colony. So I was thinking about putting um, like a pool noodle on the um, uh, on the T-post as padding in case one were to run into it just to, you know, sort of satisfy my worries about that. But, but you showed something where you had that pelican perched on top. Have you thought about trying to put something on top of the post like I was thinking a clear salad bowl, like if you flip it over and drill a hole in it and jam it down on top of the T-post or like glue it to the top of the T-post, it would keep rain and like moisture off the trail cam, which maybe is good too, and, and poop off of it. Um, and then that way, if you used like a small clear salad bowl that was steep, then the birds couldn't really perch on it because they would just slip off. Like... This, it was just a, I was, because I got to put my cameras out, right, like pretty soon. And so I, I was wondering if you had experimented with anything like that, or if you've talked to other researchers, because it's a, it's a common problem. Yeah, and closing any camera with like maybe as big as something as a salad bowl is actually bad because the cameras will overheat. <laughs> oh, no, but, you, but like underneath, right? So it's just, so you put it on the post and the bowl's just on top of the post and then the camera's down a little bit. That could work. Someone mentioned, oh, I don't remember what it's called, but basically, oh, what are they called? It's like a triangle thing. Like anything that forms a triangle, like made out of plastic, 
like just to put that on top of the camera um that would work someone said to use a spring like a cat toy that's a spring I don't know if anyone has a cat that knows what I'm talking about um to just glue that on um I haven't tried any of them just because it's not that big of an issue it doesn't happen that often uh <laughs> and I'm nervous to hurt them yeah I, the spring I mean I think cormorants would just rip the spring off and put it in their nest like that's what they do but, yeah. But no, that, no, those are interesting ideas. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's a, just a practical problem I'm trying to think about how to solve. I also have to carry all those plastic bowls across a mile and a half island. Yeah. I, <laughs> we try to carry as few things as possible. Sand Island is 300 feet across at high tide, so it's like... Oh whatever. my gosh, I'm so jealous. And it's hot. When it says 90, it's it feels like 113. So... Um, but anyway, yeah, thanks for that. I, I, uh, we'll see, we'll see if I can get my cameras to stay in place and not suffer the same fate as some of them did last year. Yeah, I can send you the link to the two posts that I use because it's flat. There's like grooved ones and those don't hold the cameras as well. I know that sounds weird. They should, but they don't. We've tried both. Oh, I was going to use those, um, they they make T-post mounts so you can like screw it onto there. Oh, fancy. Okay. Um, you can get them at the hardware store for just like a couple bucks. Nice. Cool. I just thought of something too for um, Juita. I know you said you had like 4 million images or something to go through. Did you have any opportunities for like us to help out or volunteer with going through Ooh. any of that data or images that you have? It actually takes forever to upload these images onto a cloud. For my first year here, when I tell you I tried so hard to upload it onto a cloud that I just ended up giving up, I just couldn't. It took months um, with all this data. So unless someone is like physically in the state that I can give them a hard drive or like a flash drive, it's probably not possible. And I'm hoping to subset pretty, like pretty heavily subset. Um, so hopefully I will graduate by next December. <laughs> I've also just mailed them the physical drives before, just make a copy. And I've even mailed like full-size hard drives with big stuff like that. It's just impractical. Yeah, I mean, it's good. This is a 10 terabyte hard drive. It'll it'll take so long for me to copy this. I don't even know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the <laughs> amount of images. I wish there was a faster way. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Great. Well, thank you so much again, Jurita. Oh, what's your Twitter name? Can you put that in the chat? Yeah, it's actually just my first name and my last. Okay, cool. Thank you. I can share it again there, too. Oh, cool. Oh, nice. Okay. And if anyone has, like, our Twitter is fire. You gotta, everybody follow Julita if you use Twitter. She's got a great Twitter. If anyone needs help on their REU application, I am here to look it over if you want. Cool. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, and have a good rest of the evening. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Oh, she's gone. <laughs> Thank you, Frank and Daniel. <laughs>